Give it up for the worship team. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, if I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name is Troy Dinsdale. I have the honor and the privilege of uh, being, a, I, in my opinion, uh, I have the calling of being the greatest servant of this faith family. I want to serve this faith family well, but I'm the campus pastor here at Greenhouse Orlando. It's an honor to have you guys here with us. Um, if you, so if you're not from the United States of America, raise your hand. Okay, okay, I know where you guys are from, but they're from Canada because they're my siblings. Where are you from? Iran? How do you say love in what, in Iran? Oh man, that's bad. I should, oh, that's so bad. Say, how, how do you say it? That's exactly how you say it. That's right, okay. So, um, that's awesome. No. Anybody else, anybody else not from the, I'm so, what was the name of the language? Farsi. Farsi. Oh, I never would have gotten that. So, wow. Thank you. That's, that's so cool. I didn't know that. Anybody else not from the United States of America? Man, everyone else is from here. Okay. Anybody speak a different language? Anyone speak a different language? What do you speak? How do you say love in Latin? Um, amor, right? That's right. Okay. And who else speaks another language? Anyone else speak another language in here? Right there, what do you speak? Creole. Creole, okay, how do you say love in Creole? Damu. Oh, there you go, come on, amen. I love it. Hey, listen, I love celebrating other cultures and backgrounds and ethnicities, and it's, it's an honor to have everyone here. I believe that, that the, the, the melting pot of all of that is, a, is, is exactly how God's kingdom is and is supposed to be. And so it's such an honor to be a part of a church that's like that. Like, thank you, welcome. Um, by the way, before we jump into this message, I want to remind you or inform you for the first time that after immediately following service, we will have free lunch for everybody. So don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. It's going to be amazing. And also, if you have little kids that are in the kids' ministry being discipled over there, we have a bounce house for them, and then we'll have a few other games and stuff. So listen. I'm not going to say the adults can't go in there, but if a kid gets injured, I know my wife will kill you, so I'm just throwing that out there, and then she'll ask God for forgiveness. All right, so, hey guys, I'm so excited. We are in the midst of a series called what? Anybody know? Let me tell you a story. That's right. Let me tell you a story. We're looking at the parables of Jesus and we, we're, we're, as we navigate through these parables, we are trying to get to know God, his character, and what he, how he longs for us to live and to posture our lives. And we say that parables are uh, earthly stories that reveal heaven realities, right? They're earthly stories that give us a, an image and a glimpse of God and his character and his kingdom and how it is. And this book is the Bible, and we, we believe it is the inerrant word of God. We believe that this is God's words towards us. We believe that God is about love. Everyone say love. Love. God is about love and his unconditional love towards us as his people, as his children. And last week we talked about, does anybody remember what parable we talked about last week? Any, any, any takers? The parable of the workers in the vineyard. And everyone's like, ah, yeah, that's right. The parable of the workers in the vineyard. And we talked about how life isn't fair. And if you, by the way, if you missed that message and you want to listen to it, you can always listen to us. Uh, you can always find our messages on YouTube. Find them on our website as well. Um, but you can find us on YouTube, Greenhouse Church Orlando, and you can subscribe, and then you'll get notifications when that comes in. But if you, uh, if you did, missed or if you, ha- you know, if you remember the message from last week, we talked about how life isn't fair and how God's kingdom isn't fair as well, but that's a good thing. And I got, how the grace of God over our lives and how what Jesus did for us who, honestly, we did not deserve life, but he has given us life. And that's not fair but I'm so grateful for that. I'm so thankful for that. I'm sure all of us in this room are. God's kingdom is not fair. If you guys would, grab your Bibles. If you need a Bible, there's a gentleman standing back there with a Bible. Anyone want a Bible, raise your hand and he'll bring you one. If not, if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, grab it and turn to Luke chapter 10. And we, we like to hear, uh, stand up for the initial reading of God's word. So if you guys wouldn't mind standing to your feet in reverence for the word of God, Luke chapter 10, verse 25. And when you're there, say, let's do this. 
Luke chapter 10, verse 25. And to give you a bit of a, a backstory here, what we, what we are walking into is a lawyer who at the same time, in Jesus' time, they weren't necessarily lawyers that we know of today. They were more so teachers of the law, and that's what another version says. They were essentially, the thing that we have comparable to lawyers at this time would have been like professors at theology, at the seminary, you know, professors of theology. They were those who were well-educated, and they, they were uh, very well aware of what the law said, and they were law abiders as best as they could be. And this is Jesus, or, and so here, verse 25. And behold, the lawyer stood up to put him to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit life? Eternal life. Eternal life, right? Eternal life in heaven. Happiness. He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he Desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And so likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side in avoidance. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. Everyone say compassion. Compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers. And he said, obviously, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. I find it interesting that this man is seeking to justify himself, wondering who his neighbor is, and Jesus' response is, go be a neighbor. (laughs) Pray with me. Father, we love you. Jesus, show us Teach us, reveal to us the truth in this passage and let it transform our lives, God. Help us to live with compassion the way you do. Help us to love the way you do. In Jesus' name, amen. High five someone, have a seat. And tell your neighbor, be a neighbor. All right, guys, so we don't have a whole lot of time, so for the next two hours, I want to dive into this, and <laughs> everyone's like, obviously, he's not going to talk for two hours. I think I would put myself to sleep if I talked for two hours. Hey, so I have a question, and it's a rhetorical question. You don't feel, like, don't feel like you have to answer this, but I want you to answer it internally, and the question is simple. Are you happy? Right, like, are you happy? You know, and, and, and it's a good question to ask, and, and if the answer is yes, why? Why are you happy? But if the, question, if the answer to the question is, I don't know, or I don't think so, or I don't feel happy right now, why? Why not? This is a, it's a valuable and important question to ask ourselves. It's interesting, though, that we get spurts of happiness, though. I like to kind of do the, you know, the, the injection symbol I, you know, it's interesting that we get injections of happiness from really random things. You know, I was kind of pondering this this week, and I'm like, what in the past, in the past, like, few months has made me, has given me bursts of happiness? And I have to humbly admit and confess that one of those things that gives me bursts of happiness is when I receive packages in the mail from Amazon Prime. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest with you guys. There is something so invigorating of like getting a, or like, especially when you're driving home, you're like, 
it's on the porch. And you pull and you're like, yeah, you know. I don't know if you guys feel this way. And if you, if, you're, if you say no, you're probably lying. Either that or you don't have Amazon Prime. Because there's just something about like, even when you know, you're like, man, like my daughter even joins in now. She's like, daddy, we got a package. And I'm like, yes. And she's like, what do you think it is? And I'm like, I don't know, but I think I do know. But still, it's so exciting. It could be something different. You know, maybe they messed up. I don't know, you know. But you're like, what, is, what might this be? And you're like, ah. And you open it up and you're like, yes. And I always try to get excited for my daughter anyways. I'm like, it's envelopes. You know, we ordered envelopes in the mail, you know, because we order everything on Amazon Prime now. And, you know, whatever it may be. Or I know the other thing that kind of gives me bursts of happiness, and I have to admit this, this is a weakness of Troy. You want to know which one of Pastor Troy's struggles are? It is gluttony. It is gluttony. I love food. All right, listen, if Chipotle is in my near future, I am excited. Like, I'm like, oh, man, this, I, I can't even think fully. I'm in conversation. I'm thinking about Chipotle. I'm like, hold on, I miss what you said. Say that again because Chipotle is on my mind. If it's chocolate, like Catherine said, hallelujah for chocolate. That is the heavenly dessert right there. To me, dessert is not a dessert without chocolate. I'm sorry. All right, so, but there's little things that give me bursts of excitement and happiness. And then that Amazon package comes. I open it up. I'm like, sweet. And then that happiness kind of fades, right? And then I'll be like, oh, man, I... I Confession time, I have been in moments where I literally go look for things that I might need so that I can get a package in the mail because I really like that feeling. I don't know if any of you guys can relate to that, but that is a struggle of mine. Now, mind you, though, my wife and I have discovered it's, it's, it's honestly a bad thing. <laughs> but we discovered online Facebook groups where people who start selling products on Amazon want to build up reviews. So they will, you, you, they will, you will set up and you will purchase what they are selling and then you review it, and you show them you review it, and they refund your money. So you essentially get free stuff. I mean, if you think about it, right? So you're like, oh, man. At first, we're like, oh, this is great. Like, we got certain things. I'm like, man, I got, like, we got, like, a, a cup holder that goes in your car that, like, holds your phone, like, a, a whole thing. Like, we got little things like that. You get, like, little dresses and things for the kids and toys. And after about a week, you're like, oh, man, this is feeding into an addiction that's very unhealthy. <laughs> because we're getting, like, packages every single day. And you're like, woo, it's like Christmas morning, you know. I don't, there's no one else feel that way, man. Like, Christmas morning when Amazon packages arrive at my door. Whatever it may be, maybe it's something else for you that gives you a bit of bur- a burst of happiness. Whatever it may be. The problem, though, is we are all prone to a happiness that is actually not really that healthy. Like, we're all prone to these injections of happiness. Some of us, it might be Netflix binging. We might have go through our day thinking about, I can't wait to watch that show again tonight when I get home because I'm going to feel good. I, I really dislike my job. I can't wait to get oh, just away from my job because so, I'm unhappy. We lo- whatever it may be, we look for little injections of happiness and we live for those injections of happiness and we build up these addictions to these little jolts of happiness. And ultimately, this gives us a glimpse of, of how we approach life. Like, if we look at our lives, and it's funny because the lawyer asked this question. And the lawyer asked this question out of selfish motives. Because he, what he, who is he thinking about in this moment when he asked this question? How do I inherit life, eternal life? How can I get there? What do I need to do? What boxes do I need to check off to make sure that I get to my happiness? Do I get to this eternal happiness and it's so funny to me that he asked this question, and essentially, though, this is a good depiction of our lives because we spend so much of our lives inward-focused, and we are so constantly trying to inwardly appro- uh, f- pursue happiness and jolts of happiness in our lives, and we look inwardly to, pr- to, to pursue those, and we are constantly self-centered. And it's our approach to life. And I love Jesus' response. Because Jesus' response is not even necessarily answering the question and just to give him an answer. Because once again, this gentleman was looking for what box do I need to check off to make sure I'm good? Like, what's the bare minimum, Jesus, that I can do to get into heaven? Because I just need to make sure that I'm good, right? And Jesus' response is, yeah, but who, who actually proves to be the neighbor in this sense? See, our selfish desires, they give temporary happiness, but then we get right back to where we were. It's temporary happiness, and then it's right back to where we were. And Jesus is hinting at a way to eternal happiness in in this parable. You want eternal happiness? Let's dig into this parable. See, the orientation of this lawyer's life is not 
the way to happiness. And that's what Jesus is trying to tell us. Could you imagine, though, if someone, like, the end of their life and they, got, they get to where eternal happiness is and you're like, man, how did you get here? And they're like, I did it by thinking of myself the entire time, you know? I did it by being rude to all of you guys. <laughs> like, that, ridiculous, right? And you're like, okay, that doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't make sense. That is not how we get there. And we know that. When, even though we know this, we still subconsciously pursue internal selfish desires because we feel like that is going to bring us happiness. It's a wild paradox that of, of, of humans. It's a wild, it's an issue that we wrestle with. Selfish desires absolutely never deliver on what they promise. Never. And Jesus is pointing this out. And that's, that, that, that will never deliver what we crave. And maybe, just, just maybe, maybe by thinking instead of who was the neighbor I need to love, by thinking how do I be a neighbor is, has some value in pursuing our eternal happiness that we so crave. Maybe it's that pathway. And maybe, just maybe, love. Everyone say love. Yeah. What an awesome word. I love, I love hearing it in different languages too. But what may, maybe love, maybe just maybe love is really what we actually all crave. And not just receiving love, but more importantly, giving love. Because we do know that the truest of loves, if you've been in any way exposed to the gospel and the Bible and what God's ways are, or if, I mean, honestly, in some ways our culture does know this, the truest of loves is the most selfless of loves. Selfless. It truly is better to give and receive. Hey, listen, anybody love Christmas here? Anybody love Christmas? I love Christmas, and my wife loves Christmas so much so that she'll probably start decorating for Christmas the day after Halloween. And it's the way we do, th- like, it's super early, celebrate the Christmas season, start listening to Christmas music early. Some people are like, oh, gag. I'm like, dude, there's, if you listen to Christmas music and you don't get joy, you're probably the same person that hates our country, hates chocolate, you know. I'm just, just you know, like, but there's a joy that comes. I was like, man, I feel so judged. You should. So... So, but it, 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 man, Chris, there's something so joyful. Chris, listen, when it comes to Christmas, though, I remember as, as a kid, you'd always wonder why parents, they would, they would set up the structure of the way kids open presents. And for us, it was like, man, we'd wake up at three or four in the morning, like eager, like, oh my goodness, what did Santa bring us that day? You know, we're like, man, what, what are we going to get? And the parents are like, no, 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 we wait till 8, p- 8 a.m. And, and I'm like, man, why do we have to wait till 8 a.m.? And I get it now because Christmas is not about the kids receiving the gifts. Honestly, it's about the parents. <laughs> and it's giving the gifts because, man, it's not about me. It's about mom and dad f- knowing that their gifts are a radical blessing in our lives. And now I'm a parent. Fast forward, I'm like, I'm a parent. I'm like, I see that. I want my kids to be crying in joy. Like, thank you, dad. You know, I'm like, yes, I need to see that. Like, I want Emmy to give me, like, just, to, to, like, run around speaking in tongues, like, just, ah, Dad, thank you, you know, like, whatever it may be. I'm like, yes, I want you to know that you love that doll because it's about give. It's so much better to give than it is to receive, and we love the joy when people light up. When I, when I was uh, dating my wife, her uh, family, <laughs> mind-blowing, mind her family blessed them, and they're amazing, but there's a lot of them, right? So she's one of eight kids. And so they're, they're with, with parents and then a few spouses in the meantime. I'm dating Heather, and I'm like, we're, or like, you know, there's like 12 people in this room. And it's the first Christmas I spent with their family. And everyone gets everyone a gift. So that's, do the math. Plus it's at least one gift, some more. So it's at least 150 gifts, give or take. It's a lot of Christmas gifts, all right? They, their parents were like, hey, everybody opens up one gift one at a time. And you sit in the middle, and we're going to take a picture of your reaction, and we're going to watch that, and we're all going to celebrate with you, and then you go put that gift back in the next person. And you know what's wild? You sit there, so you're like, oh, it's Johnny's turn, and then it's Bill's turn. I'm just making up names, but I'm like, and everyone's just like agonizing over their gifts. They're like, is it my turn? You know, like, you have that moment, you're like, oh my gosh, and the kids, and it's like tormenting the kids. And they're like, and it's not about the kids, because it's about, it's about the parents seeing every single gift open. Do you know how long it takes to open 150 gifts? Way too long. That's all the answer is. It's way too long. It, is, it was wildly difficult. Now, I was pursuing Heather, wanted to get on her good side and her family's good side. So I'm like, this is great, you know? Didn't push back. As soon as we locked her into marriage, I'm like, this is a problem. We need to deal with this, you know? And that's, that's what we do, right? That's what happens when, when you get married. It's, you're stuck. That's why you work out so much before you get married and you get married and you're like, I don't have to do this anymore, you know? I'm sorry, babe. I love you. I love you. We all do it. Don't judge me. All right. Hmm. Tell the truth. Shame the devil, right? All right. So. (laughs) 
See, love is the answer, though, to this question. It's love. It's love. But it's probably not the love that we might naturally be inclined to think it is. Because when it comes to love, right, it's it, like the, we think that, man, I, you love your family. Like, love, love your brothers, your sisters, your parents. Love your kids. Love, love, love. Maybe, but love. But what, we, what, we, what we're missing about what Jesus is saying in this passage, why did he use the Samaritan? We'll jump into that. But there's a reason. Because what, the big point that I want us to walk away here with today is this. You love only to the extent of which the person you love the least so your, your love, it only goes to the extent to which the person you love the least. And you're like, well, that doesn't fully make sense. What do you mean by that, Troy? Well, what I mean by that is this. It's easy for our culture to be about love, man. Love is love, you know? Like, everyone agrees in our culture we need more love. That is not the disagreement, though. The problem, though, is who we push our love onto, who we actually demonstrate love to. And the thing is that the capacity, according to God, the capacity to which we are able to love, according to his ways, the capacity of which we are able to love is defined not by who you love the most, it is defined by who you are loving the least. And that's, this is an important, important factor that we need, to, we need to pay attention to and analyze in our lives. Where do we stand with this? Because it's very, very easy to love your mom or your dad. Well, sometimes it's maybe not so easy, but usually it's a lot easier to love family, right, as it is to love your enemy, as it is to love that neighbor that you just despise, as it is to, like, your actual neighbor, you know, or as it is to love, you know, people around the world who do horrible things, people who are rejected, people who are hated, people who are discriminated against. It's a lot more difficult to love them. And Jesus is like, yeah, that's the measuring stick to which I use to value your, to, to measure your love capacity. It's to those that you love the least. I want to make some observations in this passage. We look at this passage and we get to here and, and, and I, I, as I, to kind of further prove or talk through this point, I want to look at some specific key points in this passage and we get to here, and Jesus is like, let me tell you a story, all right? And he, he introduced this man in verse 30, and he's like, Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. So this man is traveling. He's traveling. He is journeying. He would be, by, by definition, a sojourner. And what I want to submit to you guys is that we as humans, we are on a journey on earth. We are travelers. Uh, a sojourner is someone who's only temporary, temporarily in that spot. They're consistently moving, but they're only temporarily there. They are travelers on a journey. We in this life are temporarily on this planet. We have a journey that we are navigating through, but even in a greater context. So what I would suggest to you is that we are sojourners. That is the first point. Listen, by the way, if you want to take notes, you can on your bulletin that you got when you came in. They're going to flip it over. Um, I know I remember things a lot easier when I write it down, but we are sojourners, okay? So this is not only are we in the midst of traveling, Right in this whole life, but even in the moment, in moments we are but travelers from here to there. Like I am, all we are always trying to get somewhere. If I can just get this job, if I can just get this car, I'm um, you know I'm, I'm trying to have kids and do this process. I'm trying whatever it may be. I'm trying to get married one day. I'm trying whatever it may be. We're always constantly on a journey. Even something as simple as I can't wait to get home from work. We are always traveling. We are always sojourners. We are so, when Jesus is talking about this traveler, I will submit to you guys that he is, this whole parable is, a, is imagery of our relationship with God. And so we are the traveler. You are the traveler. I am the traveler. The lawyer is the traveler. And once I get there, we feel like these little jolts of happiness in the, in the temporary travels that we embark on in this, in this, light, you know, in this life, we feel like they're going to give us jolts of happiness. That's, and that's what they do. They give us temporary jolts of happiness. If, if I can just get married. I mean, I remember when I was dating Heather, I was like, if we can just get married, you know. When we get married, everything's going to be perfect. Like, this is a big lie. But, you know, you think that, though. You're like, if I can just get married, if I can, if I can just buy a house. I mean, remember when our journey of trying to buy a house, and it was one, one amazing, awesome, long journey. But to, to find a house, you know, whatever it may be, if I, can, if I can just, you know, get married, if I can just get a house one day, if I can just have kids, we're always living for the next moment because we, the temporary satisfaction that we get from each moment only lasts so long, and then we're left hung, craving more. We are travelers. We are on this journey. You know, it's funny. First, Chron or not, it's funny. First Chronicles 29, 15 says this, for we are strangers before you and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow. 
and there is no abiding. First Peter 2.11 says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. We're sojourners. It's temporary. But it's, our time on earth is so valuable. And unfortunately, sometimes, while we're trying to get there, while we are on this journey called life, and while we are attempting to get to different places, unfortunately, sometimes we get knocked down. Sometimes bad things happen. Sometimes we get robbed, like this man in this parable, robbed and beaten and left for half dead and we're bleeding. Sometimes we get knocked down because life isn't fair, just like we talked about last week. Let me tell you, you, you want, oh man. All right, this is on the spot, but hey, it's worth it. So listen, when I want to talk about life not being fair, a couple weeks ago, I, it was evening time. Kids finally got into bed. Praise the Lord for that. I've got four young kids. It's a challenge. We got all the kids in the bed. My wife's inside kind of wrapping some things up. I'm taking the dogs out as I do every night. And I'm taking the dogs out. It's a beautiful night. It's cooler. The stars are out. I'm like, man. And it had been a really busy week. And I was like, man, Lord, I really deserve some time to myself. <laughs> I was like, I think just even a couple minutes, I just want to lay on this. We have a tramp, an old trampoline someone gave, my wife's family gave us. And so I'm like, I want to lay on the trampoline as I've done a few times in the past and just, just enjoy it. Just be here. You know, anyone know, everyone relate to that? Like, I just need to be here, look up at the stars, and just enjoy because it's been a nonstop couple weeks. You know? So I roll over and I jump on and I roll on the trampoline. Now, I know in doing that, my dog, we have a pup, and he comes, he always comes up and pokes his nose up on me. He just wants to interact with me. Dogs are awesome and weird at the same time. So he does that. And so sure enough, I, I feel like, it, you know, him hit my leg. And I kid you not, in a split, literally a split second, this all went through my mind. Because he'll poke up and poke up and poke up. But he poked up and it just stayed there. And then it starts moving up my leg in my pants. All right. All right. No joke. In a split second, I realize that's not his nose. That is something else. Oh, man, that's a frog. <laughs> Crawling up my pants. No, I'm not, I can't make this up. So I, I mean, you know, you ever wish, you're like, man, I wish there was a security camera to watch this because now I can go back and I would probably cry, like laughing at myself. But in, I mean, split second, realize, ah! I, like, you know, you're just moving, like trying to, whatever is your pants, I jump off the trampoline, fall off the trampoline. I'm just like, you know, you, you just like panic in that moment, right? So I, I and, and I get to this point where I'm like, whoo, okay, I don't feel my leg anymore, and it's not there. I'm like, it's gone. I'm like, but you still feel weird. You're like, I'm so shook up, you know? And I'm yelling. I, no joke. If my neighbors heard this, I'm yelling. I'm like, ah, you know, get up. This is unfair, you know? Like, and I'm yelling. So I'll be like, that being said, I'm like, whoo, all right. So I'm like, I feel where it was. I'm like, oh, there, it's wet there. I was like, oh, that's so weird, so gross. And I'm like, man, someone's probably laughing somewhere at me right now. Probably God. So we, and so I'm like, all right. So I, but at some point I was like, I just have to make sure it's not there anymore somewhere, right? So I'm sticking my hands, and yeah, it's, it's embarrassing, but I'm sticking my hands in my pants and feeling around. It's still there. I hit that frog and I'm like, ah! you know, I'm like, and I just shoot the, and I see it shoot out of my leg on the grass and it's just sitting there looking at me. I'm like, ah! Ah! So, and I, in that moment, I'm like, this is unfair. I just wanted one moment, you know, one moment. And, the, and now, to this day, I've not gone on that trampoline at night, and it, it's not going to happen. Life isn't fair, all right? Life is unfair. And I know that's a, you know, it's a funny, now it's funny. It wasn't funny in the moment, but it's so funny now. Now it's a funny example, but unfortunately, though, some of you guys in this room, you know, and, 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 and even myself, we've experienced like real deal, real deal trials. You know, some, some of us may have lost somebody close to us too early. Honestly, is it ever not too early? Some of us may have been abused in the past, you know, in some manner by someone you may have loved or cared about or thought, you loved, thought they loved you. What, we, you may have been taken advantage of by people in your life. Man, life isn't fair and things knock us down and we're left bleeding and hemorrhaging on the side of the road feeling like everything's over. Life can sometimes serve some things that are overwhelming. And we get to this point, and Jesus says, in verse 30, he continues on, you know, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Church, my second point is this. We are all half dead. 
apart from God, apart from Jesus, every single one of us is half dead. When, when Jesus is talking about this man, it is exactly us. We are all half dead. Ephesians 2, 1 says this, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins. The first half of Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. Romans also tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Listen, we may be very much alive on the outside, and let's be honest, if you're like me, I can be very good at hiding the mess on the inside. But the reality of it is that according to what the Bible tells us in our sin, we are all dead on the inside apart from God which means we are half dead, alive on the outside, dead on the inside. By definition, we are all half dead. This lawyer's half dead. You're half dead. I'm half dead. And then here comes this priest. And it's so interesting. It's so, Jesus is amazing. He brings this priest and this Levite, and they walk right by him. They actually, not even just right by him, they avoid him. I don't know if you guys have ever done that. I've, I've, I've countless times... I'll be driving and I'll come up to a homeless person by the side of the road and I'll try to change lanes or I'll just not connect eyes to them because I don't want to deal with them. And I'm, I'm going to humbly admit that that is a problem that I have. But this, they, they walk right by. They avoid. They walk on the other side of the road and they avoid this man. Here's what's cool though. The, 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 and the imagery here. The priest, a, per, a teacher of the law. The Levite, a teacher of the law. Jesus is trying to show us that right here, this is the law cannot and will never save you. The law won't. It was never meant to. God gave us the law to show us how depraved we are. He gave us the law to define the line and to show us you can't, you messed up. You, you are not living the way you are supposed to. This is the way you are supposed to live. That will never save you. It wasn't a bash against priests, and it wasn't a bash against, he was trying to demonstrate that this, the law will never save you. It's incapable of it. And even, unfortunately, though, even though sometimes we may have our days, and, and when it comes to the Ten Commandments and, you know, do not steal and do not murder, we may not do some of them sometimes, but I promise you, all of us have broken at least one. All of us have fallen short. All of us, all of us fall short. The law cannot help us, and it will never help us when we are in our bleeding state on the side of the road like this man. But then Jesus moves on. He says, but then there's a Samaritan. A Samaritan comes to the road. Verse 33 and 34. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on, on pouring on oil and wine, and then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. You know, Samaritans at the time were half-breeds, and that's a, the easiest way to describe them. They were essentially half-Jewish and half-mutt, you know, not Jewish. And according to the Jews, they were, they were an abomination. So they were rejected, they were hated by Jewish people, and it's ironic that a Jewish man is being rescued by someone who is rejected by his people. <laughs> ironic. It's ironic. That's why I want to tell you guys that in this, as Jesus is revealing himself, when he brings up this good Samaritan, I would submit to you that Jesus is the good Samaritan. Jesus being someone who, let's be honest, we see it in scripture, he was hated by his own people. He was rejected by the Jewish Israelites. Hated, rejected, and yet he came to save just those people. It's to save those people. Jesus is the good Samaritan. And Jesus is the one who shows compassion. Listen, it's, this is what God has done since the beginning of time. Since, since we messed up in the garden, God has done nothing but show compassion when all he could have ever done was showed his justice. And his, he showed compassion and gave us grace. Isaiah 30, 18 says this, Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you, therefore he will rise up to show you compassion, for the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. And the Samaritan came to the man. Oh, listen, this is one of my favorite parts of the, 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 the parable. The Samaritan doesn't just walk to him and be like, and, and ask him, hey, crawl to me. The Samaritan went all the way to the dead man, the half-dead man. He goes all the way to it. Listen, there is a God 
There's a God who cares. And if you are dying and broken, if you are hurting, if you are lost, if you are, feel like you're knocked down, you're bleeding, you're separated from him, you're full of sin, he is the one who is walking for, to you. He is the one who is coming towards you. You cannot, you are incapable of walking to God. That's, that's, that's what we get from this picture. That's what the Bible tells us. We are incapable of earning our way towards God. We are incapable. We are not capable. <laughs> we are incapable. But God is a God who shows compassion and says, I know that and I'm coming to you. Jesus is the good Samaritan. He's the great Samaritan. And if you allow him to, he will bind up your wounds and he will begin the process of healing. And then he'll take you to an end. And so he takes him to an end. And church, listen, I, this is, we've depicted who we are in the story as individuals. We've depicted who Jesus is in the story. But this last, it's like, why bring up an inn? So at the time, inns were, inns were, their hotels weren't a thing. It wasn't like people, it's like a regular traveling occurrence that people are going to stop in the middle of the night, get off their camel and go into a hotel. Like that wasn't what they did at this time. Now when it came to inns though, what we know historically and according to theologians is that inns were a place of, like literally a place of refuge. They were places in the dark, dark corners of the, of, the, of the land, in the dark spots and in the, the, the parts away from the cities and away from the towns where people were regularly beaten and robbed. And it was a place of refuge for them to be restored. That's what the inn was. And it's so amazing that Jesus uses this as his analogy here because what I'm about to submit to you is this. The church, the church, the church is supposed to be the modern day inn. The church is supposed to be the inn. This, this is what G, he depicts who we are. We are absolutely, we are the um, separated from God. We are, we are his, I'm, I'm forgetting my points right now in this moment. What were my points? Oh my goodness. Okay, we are all half dead, so we are all half dead. We are, um, we are all sojourners, that's what it was, thank you. I'm like, man, Lord, help me. We are all traveling in this journey. We are all sojourners. We are all half dead, separated from God, can't get our way to God, and God says, hey, I'm the good Samaritan. I'm coming to you. I will pick you up if you allow me to. If you let me restore you, I will restore you. But in that, though, I'm not gonna just keep you for myself. I'm gonna put you into a community, into a home, if you into an inn where you Will, they will continue your restoration process and then you one day will become an innkeeper that will help restore others. This is the gospel. Jesus is depicting himself in the gospel in this whole parable and where we fit in. We are supposed to be an inn. You know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's mind-blowing, but Jesus says, he says, take care of this person. And he says, until when? And what's his response? Anyone remember what his response was? Until I return. Until I come back. Take care of him until I come back. We know that Jesus is coming back. He is coming back. And our call as the body of Christ, as the church of those who have been restored already, is to take care of those who have not been restored. Our call is to take care of one another and go reach those who've been, who are on the side of the road, who are beaten, who are bruised, who are bloody, who are half dead, who are separated and can't get their way there. We are supposed to be the inn when Jesus rescues them. And of course, it is always Jesus who does the rescuing. We can't save people. And I long to care so much for people. Here's the thing, church. Jesus, when he cared so much for people in the Bible that he was accused of being things that he wasn't. He was accused of, of being somebody who was accepting of certain practices. He was accused of being someone who was condoning certain practices. He was allowing, he was, he was accepting, if you would, of, of things that they believed to be sinful. He wasn't. But because he was so radically loving and so compassionate and went into their world to love them where they were and to accept them and to provide wholeness and healing in their lives, it came off like that to the rest of the world. Church, I, if we are not being accused of things, of, if we are not being accused of, of being accepting of things or, or like, uh, uh, allowing certain activities, we, we are, I would suggest to you that we are not loving the way God has called us to love. 
Like if, we're, if we are not at least being accused of it, I wonder if we're really following in the footsteps of Jesus, who's accused of so many things. And what, what I mean by that is this. As an example, next Saturday, we are going to be, uh, a, a group of us from our church are going to be attending and are showing up to the Pride Orlando 2019, like the LGBTQ plus gathering. And here's why. We believe that Jesus, number one, Jesus went into the world. He went into the world of the sinners and went to love them where they were. He didn't expect them to come into his world, right? So we, they're, I can promise you they are never going to come into our world here. They, they, they are afraid. They are fearful. I've talked to countless people in that community. They literally shake at the thought of being near Christians or in, in, in a room with a bunch of Christians because they've been so hated, so rejected, despised by church in the past. So we're going to go into their world and we're going to bring a simple message. God loves you. We are going to show grace first, which is what Jesus did every time. He did it at the woman at the well. He did it with the prostitute. He, he shows grace first. And then he responds with truth after that. But we, well, we're going to do this. Listen, I can tell you, I can tell you, even there's some people in this church who might think, there might be people in this room right now that might think, that's going to give off an image that we accept what they do. I don't care. Jesus did the exact same thing. We are going to go into this world. We're not going to tell anyone that we accept what they do. We are going to go love the way we are called to love. And I hope people accuse us of that. Because that's how I will have some comfort knowing I'm doing what God's called us to do. Listen, church, we want to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. It's not easy. You will be accused of wrongdoing. You will be persecuted. You will be rejected. I can promise you that when we go there, there will be people, a lot of people in that community that reject us. I'm just praying that there are a few that listen. I'm praying that there's a few that will receive the love that we have to give, and it's God's love. We've got to be the church. We've got to be the church. Who else is going to do it? It's our calling. And then I love how Jesus closes with, whatever you spend, he's talking to the innkeeper. He goes, whatever you spend, what does he say? I will repay it. And you know, it's hard to talk about money in church. Ooh, money, oh man, that's a, that's a scary subject for us. Ah, churches, you know, have abused this in the past and I don't know how I feel about money. And, and it's so ironic, but Jesus talks about money a lot. And he talks about generosity a lot and giving a lot. And, and even here, specifically, he's talking about money. And, and, and I, would, I would suggest to you, too, even just time and effort. But Jesus specifically is like, here's some money to do what you need to do. Now, anything you spend on your own before I get back, I will repay. I will repay. Church, I don't think there's any way to avoid the reality that God is keeping track of every dollar that you spend towards furthering his kingdom. He keeps track of it. You might think that $5 is not doing anything. Like, who really cares? God does. He absolutely cares. Why? Not necessarily the amount that you give, but where your heart is. Are you really loving? It is absolutely, as Acts 20 says, it is absolutely far better to give than it is to receive. Can we actually start living like that? Can we, if we're looking for jolts of happiness that are really not going to satisfy, I promise you, living a life of generosity is not a temporary jolt of happiness. Living a life of generosity is is the way to God's heart, selfless love. That's eternal happiness. That's God's kingdom coming to earth. Whatever you spend, I will repay. Question is, what does that look like for you guys? What does that look like for me, for us? I don't know. I don't know exactly what that looks like. You may not know exactly what that looks like, but God absolutely does. And as we build our relationship with him, as we individually look to God and say, Lord, all of my stuff is yours. What do you want me to do with this? See, we intentionally didn't take up a tithe after this because I don't want you to feel pressure to give. But I'm not even so concerned about your giving on a Sunday morning. You know what I'm concerned about? What happens when you leave here and Monday happens? What happens when you leave here and Tuesday happens? And you interact with someone who's hungry? What happens when you, when you leave here and you, you have a neighbor that lost their job and they, they're having a hard time paying bills? What, what happens when you have family and friends and people or even random strangers you bump into and they clearly have a need? Where's your heart? Is it on the injections of internal happiness? Ah, I can't really give because I won't have enough money for this. I can't really do it because ah, I, need, I need to make sure that my needs are met. Is, is your focus inward? Is our focus inward? Or is it, Lord, everything I have is because of you, and you say you will repay every last dollar. Now, I'm not promising you 
And that's, we can deduct that from a lot of other scriptures. I'm not promising you that you will get a lot of money back for giving money. That is the prosperity gospel. That is not what we believe here. What I do believe, though, what I do believe is that God will repay you in some way or another. And what I do believe is that he will always take care of your needs. Always. You cannot outgive God. So what does that look like in your lives? What does that look like in our lives? When we are supposed to be the in, you know what the church is, guys? The church is a gathering of God's people. Micro churches on Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday nights that we have, a gathering of God's people. That is church, just as much as this is church. So when God says the in, the church is supposed to be the in, you are supposed to be the in in your home. Your, your home is supposed to be an in. Your car is supposed to be an in. Your money is supposed to be used for the in. Whatever it may be, everything you have, we are the church together. It's so funny, we, we love to say at Greenhouse, like, hey, like, how many buildings do you guys have? And you're like, oh, man, lots. I mean, 80 buildings. That's how, how many buildings we have in our church. Like, however many houses you guys have, that's our church. Like, that is the church, right? Like, this is, this is what we believe. This is what the Bible teaches. The church is not a building. It's a gathering of God's people who are committed to his heart. So let's be the church. Let's be the in. But here's the thing. It starts, though with receiving from God. See, this lawyer was, in this time, obviously a teacher of the law. And if we're gonna be honest, each one of us has a little teacher of the law in us. Time and time again, no matter, no matter how many times we hear it, or you may have never heard it before, but we rely in a culture that has karmatic thinking, and we think what goes around comes around. What you get, what you give into it is what you get back. Or we feel like we need to earn our way there. I, I, I need to be good enough for God, I need to do this well enough for God, and it is the wrong thinking. It is the wrong, we can't, we can't. You can't earn your way there. You cannot earn your way in the, deeper into God's arms. I promise you that. And while we are, it, it's literally like a, de, a half dead body trying to move across the country to get to, it's impossible, and God knows that. But he's there next to you, waiting for you. He came to you. And all you have to do is receive. All you have to do is receive. In this journey that we're on, God's coming to you in the midst of being half dead. And if you're in this room, you're like, I don't even, I don't even have a genuine relationship with God. Man, if, if you feel God tugging at your heart, it's because he is. And he's, he's here waiting to, for you to receive him. Romans 6, 23, I mentioned it earlier. It says, for the wages of sin is death. Are you broken? Are you hurting? Are you depressed? Full of anxiety? The Bible says, cast your anxieties in the Lord, for he cares. You feel guilty? You feel empty? Separated from God? It's because of the sin in you. It's because of the sin in each one of us that has caused a distance. It has ruined, it has caused us to be half dead and separated us from Jesus. And abiding by rules will never get us back. And as Romans 6, 23 continues on. It says, but, I love the buts. But the gift, the gift, everyone say the gift. The gift, the free gift, something we did not deserve. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's a gift. You just have to receive it. See, Jesus is the good Samaritan that came to you, came to me, and he loves you, and there's nothing you can do. Listen, Christians, those of us that follow Jesus, I, we need to remind ourselves of this, because even in following Jesus, even when we did submit to him, we still somehow lose sight sometimes of how we entered into his righteousness, and we still feel like we have to earn our righteousness. We still do. Can we give up? You know what's so funny, the, 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 the dichotomy, the irony going on here. When we choose to give up trying to perform and earn our way there, that's actually when we receive God's righteousness that he's given us, that's actually when we are able to perform <laughs> the way he's called us to live. And all you have to do is receive. Hey, can we have our prayer people come up here? I want to, listen, church, we're going to close out with some worship, and then we'll get some free food, Hallelujah. But I, listen, I, God loves you so much. I love you so much. 
so honored you guys are here and today a part of our faith family. But these people up here at the front, genuinely no different from you, not better than you, probably worse than you, I mean, if we're going to be honest, right? But, but people willing to pray with you. We're all messed up. We all have our issues. We all navigate through these issues together. Well, we're supposed to do it together. We try to do it alone. Man, can you, can you just take a moment, everyone close your eyes, and just take a moment and say, Lord, should I go get prayer? Help me to be humble enough if I should. And if you need prayer for anything, if you need prayer for healing, we've already had a healing today. If you want to be prayed again for healing, if you need prayer for something that's going on in your life, if you want to talk to one of these people up here who are more than capable of talking to you about giving your life to Jesus, like I have, I've kind of been a Christian. I kind of grew up in a Christian home, but I never really like fully made it my own relationship. I kind of just did it because that's just what we did. Or if you just, did, or if you're coming from a different background, you have no clue who Jesus was before you came in the doors today. Man, my prayer is that God would reveal Himself to you more and more. But come and get prayer. Come and talk to someone up here. No pressure, but man, I know that it'll change your life if you if you do feel led to and you do it. So I want everyone to stand to your feet. We're going to close out in some worship. While the worship is happening, and then I'll come up and dismiss us, but while the worship's happening, feel free to come up at any point during worship and get prayer for. And Daniel and the worship team, why don't you guys take it from here?